Hey there, I'm Greg Finn. And I'm Christine Zernheld. A.K.A. Shep. And it is officially Marketing O'Clock here on August 23rd, 2019. Remember, you can catch our famous Friday news shows each and every Friday morning. We read all the news. So you don't have to. And if you want to follow along with us, just check out our show notes or head over to marketingoclock.com for all the links from today's articles. And please subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. All right, first up, Shep, we've got some housekeeping Ooh. for you. If you love what you're hearing here on Marketing O'Clock, we've got some new handles for you to follow on your local social network, whether it be the gram from Facebook, <laughs> the tweet machine, or the book itself. You can follow along on the Marketing O'Clock handle on any of those networks. So follow along and you'll get just the condensed version from today's show and a little bit of sass as well. Always the sass. Always. And also, hopefully, we've had some of our audio issues fixed. We had a compressor blow, we've got a new mixer, and we've got some new luxurious HD quality content, some sound for your lobes. Luxurious on luxurious. the lobes. Luxurious. I like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. All right, and we're on to the main news this week from Search Engine Journal. And first up, we are saying our eyepiece to accelerated bidding. Well, sort of, right? Sort of. Sort of is the right way to put it, as a update has come out saying that starting September 17th, standard delivery will be the only ad delivery method for search, shopping, and for anything with a shared budget. I'm going to back it up quick. Until September 17th, up to <laughs> September 17th, we've been able to have accelerated budgets where you could spend as fast as you wanted to try to get as many clicks as early as you could throughout the day. The other option would be to do standard bidding, where a good example that we use for clients many times is to say, instead of getting a few clicks in the morning and running out of our budget and not showing up the rest of the day, standard budgets or standard delivery would segment that out so mm -hmm. that if you got a few clicks in the morning, you might sh not show so that your budget would last a little bit longer. Um, and the accelerated version, again, if somebody is doing well, where I was like, do accelerated, because if you're doing, yeah. uh, if, if what you are doing today is profitable, let's get more of that as soon as we can. But that's going away. Um, however, accelerated delivery will still be available for display campaigns and for video campaigns. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> That's a great question. The, the The rationale behind what Google had said is that they're now smart enough to say we can bid properly for you throughout the day. And with accelerated delivery, they were saying you might have higher CPCs earlier, again, which didn't make sense to me. But the thought process is the machine learning is good enough now that we don't need to have accelerated and it can figure out for throughout the entire day for you. I don't buy that. And the other thing that makes me think here, and the only person I saw mention this on Twitter was John Caglin, is they specifically say that it will help you maximize performance within your daily budget. To me, if you're accelerating your bids like you used to be able to do, you would make sense if you spent over your daily budget. Yeah. So spending maybe, say, 2x your daily budget, <laughs> which is what will happen now on Google Ads, would make sense. But now if everything is standard, why would you ever go 2x over your budget? Yeah. You would think you would just stay within it. It doesn't make sense now to say you, that you're eligible to go 2x over your daily budget. Especially if you're using like, maximize conversions or something. Right. You would think you would just get all the conversions you could, and even if it was earlier in the day. Like, I don't see how these two things would work together. So I want to see how this plays into just the overall spends. Is it still going to be going substantially over, even though we're, everything's a, a standard budget now? I don't know. We need answers. And so one other thing to note, you probably see a lot of little notifications showing up in your ads account. Um, they will be switched over automatically if you don't switch over from accelerated to standard, it'll be automatically switched over on October 1st hmm. for you. And again, as of September 17th, 
you will no longer be able to, to set something up as accelerated. October 1st was the day Charlie went to the chocolate factory too. Really? Yeah. Did you just make that up? No, it's true. It's my sister's birthday, so I remember Okay. It. Yeah. I was about to say, how do you know that? <laughs> Does your calendar Bring this have... ticket on October the 1st. You don't remember that? I, I, October 2nd was when Viola Beauregard turned into a blueberry. I think that was the first two. Oh, Did same they day. spend the night? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Well, I have news from Twitter, who is giving advertisers the option to bid on the first six seconds of an ad view, a video ad view. So if advertisers choose this bidding option, they'll only be charged if their 15 second or shorter video ad is viewed for at least six seconds with pixels at 50% in view. So this seems really great. And it's similar to the YouTube six second bumper ads, but offers the flexibility of running longer creative so you're not limited to six seconds. The first thing I immediately thought of here, and I bet Hope did as well, is that I'm surprised Twitter's getting back into six second video. They bought Vine and then just crushed it. (laughs) Vine was six second video. It was six seconds? Yes. Why did I think it was longer than that? No, it's six second. Now they're just bringing it back. That's those nice. poor, those poor vine heads like Hope over there. <laughs> <laughs> so you can make vine ads now at Hope at Work Hope. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even sell Vine. They just they closed it. Closed okay. So anyway, six Vine's seconds. Vine's dead. R.I.P. in peace. All right, peace, peace. Yeah, Divine. so this can be used for promoted video ads, in-stream video sponsorships, in-stream video ads for assets 15 seconds or less in length. Those three video types. All right, so look for that in your in a Twitter ads account near you. And now it's time for the take of the week. This is a saucy hashtag fire digital marketing take with extra spice served up for you. And this is just spice. It doesn't have mm-hmm. to be good spice. It doesn't have to be bad <laughs> spice. It just has to be spice, and you decide. And this week's take comes from Tim Solo. And Tim is one of the partners, I believe, over at A-Refs, A-H-Refs, A-H-Refs. And Tim put out a tweet saying, it never ceases to amaze me how many brands are bidding in Google for capital their branded keywords. Isn't that traffic yours by definition? Isn't Google's primary job as a search engine to give people exactly what they're looking for? Props to whoever at Google pulled this off. Clap emoji, clap emoji. Tim then followed it up, and this is part of the take. Dot, dot, in anticipation of PPC experts slash agencies jumping in with some quote, juicy benefits of bidding on your brand keywords and getting, quote, cheap PPC traffic, sorry, I'm not going to pay for my branded keywords. It's Google's job to rank me number one for my brand, period. Wow. Wow. So this call (laughs) caused a major uproar in the paid and the organic, the, the SEO community. Huge backlash. My favorite thing that people responded to Tim on was screenshots of Ma's advertising all over the the AREF's name, which, I mean, burn there. He had some different rebuttals saying that only 3% of people click on those ads, something like that. But that's an interesting take to have. It's a really bad take to have if you have clients' objectives in mind. Because you have, to, it's your job to do well for clients. I get it. He's got his own company and can, can have his own thoughts. And apparently it's Google's job to do well for him. So, yeah, well, <laughs> it, it, it's Google's primary job as a search engine to do well by him. But <laughs> it also caused one of the, the best reactions, I think, or I guess this was up for take of the week as well, but came from Marty Weintraub, the Marty Weintraub over at AimClear. And he put out a post where he looked at all these different complaints that people had and then the reality behind them. And it was a very aggressive post. (laughs) And in the post itself, he said, in reality, SEO sucks as a sustainable one-trick pony channel. And that makes sense, right? Like you can't just do one thing and not ever update it and hope to see the results come through. So he was trying to make a point there that you need to put effort in 
specifically. That got taken then by things like Media Post, and they just kind of quoted him saying, SEO sucks, <laughs> which is not what he said. <laughs> but it turned into this huge beef across the board. So Shep, what do you think of the initial take from Tim? I just It's not Google's job to do his job. And I, in a perfect world, that would be great, but you can't help it if your competitors are bidding on your branded terms. You got to stick up for yourself and bid on them too. Yes. I, see, I get what he's saying. I am sort of team Tim. You are. But I would never do that for my clients right. or anything that mattered. Deep down inside, I want to be Tim, uh -huh. but I'm just not. That's not how the world works. It's not how the world works. And he came up with a, a secondary tweet saying, so our reasons behind not bidding on our branded keywords are almost entirely ideological. And that's like mic drop. So if you think that that's the case and that's your ideology, then good. I'm glad that you are sticking to your, you know, your guns, I guess. And to me, though, if you have a competitor bidding on your term, even if it's 3 4%, you need to protect that. And it's a sad state, I guess, that we're in. Mm -hmm. But you have to buy your own terms. And it's crazy. And we make this, t this argument all the time to our clients. And many times we can't get this to work unless we show them these kind of horror stories of what it looks like for their term on Google. Mm -hmm. And so it's... Uh, it, it, it's a thought. It's a take that a lot of people have. And that's not to say that everyone has to bid on their branded terms, but a lot of people do. And to right. just say it's not your job, that's yeah. just not right. And I, I envy the take, yeah. but it's not my take because <laughs> we have wish, salaries yeah. to pay and we need to keep our clients. <laughs> right. So I wish I was we, living in his world, yeah, but I'm that'd not. That'd be great. <laughs> that'd be fantastic. All right. And now it's time for this week's lightning round. Pew, pew. At this point in the show, we split up our content into two parts, paid and non-paid. I cover everything to do with advertising, aka paid, and Greg covers the organic or non-paid. So here's what's happening in the paid universe this week. Our first article is called, Are Your Google Text Ads Getting Truncated? Here's what to consider. Spoiler alert, they might be. <laughs> so the article started with a tweet from Andrea Cruz at Andrea Cruz 92 and she fabulous co-marketing. Yes, fabulous. And she noticed that Google was cutting off headlines and descriptions in positions three or four in the search results. She had a screenshot and she tweeted it and mentioned Jenny Marvin at Search Engine Land to see if she had any insight on this or what she thought. And Ginny basically replied in this article, and she did some digging and found a lot of things. You can read the whole article to see everything she found. But she showed some comparisons where she had one um, search query that she performed in 2018, and she'd do the same one today. And ads in positions one through four now did not show second descriptions at all, where in 2018 they did. Um, she also showed some examples of the same search query being performed today, and there were different results every time. And even ads that were in the same position sometimes were being truncated and sometimes weren't. And we talked about this a few weeks back where it was noticed that the font size in the SERPs was increased. And we said, oh, I wonder what this is going to mean. Mm -hmm. Hint, hint, we think this is going to mean more space for paid search. Um, it seems like it's more space for paid search, but less space for the, the current text that's being shown. Right. And I know this article has been written. I don't think this is going to stick around. I don't think you're going to keep truncating things. I, my thought is it's an oversight mm -hmm. overall. So they're always testing and you just have to experiment, especially in your responsive ads, experiment with different lengths. That was kind of her main point at the end of the article. Just yeah. keep trying different things. And annotate as well. I yes. think that's important. We, we always talk about that. But whenever there's a big change that comes out, annotate because you never remember exactly what's happening. And you always think, oh, like, I'm going to know that that's when the font size changed in Google. Google, guess what? In 2020, you're not going to remember that date. So put it in your GA. Very good point. And next up from YouTube, they are quote, finalizing plans to stop using behaviorally targeted ads on videos oriented to children. Good. Great. Good. Good. <laughs> this is where we need the me department to say, hey, stop doing that. Right. Stop doing that department. We talked about Facebook always needs this. They that Apparently YouTube needs that too. Mm -hmm, we don't it, need behavioral children targeting. No yeah. thanks. But it sounds like they might have been kind of 
urge to do this because the change comes amidst news that the FTC is investigating whether YouTube violated the Children's Online Privacy Act, which requires websites to obtain parental consent before knowingly collecting many types of information, including geolocation data, mobile phone numbers, and persistent identifiers on children under the age of 13. So when do you get a phone, by the way? Because <laughs> I've got kids. I mean, I'd, oh, yeah, you gotta think I don't about know that. when they get phones. I got one at 12. I don't think they had phones when I was 12. <laughs> I mean, there was maybe like those bricks that you'd yeah. see or like the ones attached into the cigarette lighter in the car. But they didn't have actual mobile phones. I also 12. lost it a million times in the coming years. Okay. So I think so I saying, was a little too young. You're saying tw- somewhere over 12. That's what and I'm going And it was with. a flip phone. Like, I'm blaming you. I wasn't watching YouTube videos on it with targeted ads. I was <laughs> texting my friends weird things. Like it was a different world even then. Okay. Our next article is from cypressnorth.com. Shameless plug alert. And it is called Precisely Target Your Ideal B2B LinkedIn Audience with One Powerful Tool. And it's from our very own Cole Soldwish. And he talks about all the amazing capabilities you have on the LinkedIn platform um, to target people based on professional data like job title, organization, so on and so forth. But the thing that that he points out is something that is newsworthy. I haven't seen anybody mm-hmm. really cover it. The ability not just to target, but to exclude. Nobody talks about this. I don't know why. Exactly. But he's he was just trying really hard on a specific client and found a huge benefit to excluding all these audiences that you could do now. And which it's kind of hard to find the report. Right. So there's a report that you can use that, again, I think it's newsworthy here because nobody else has, has covered it, but the ability to exclude is super powerful. And if you've used LinkedIn before and you saw some egregious spends, you may be able to use the exclusions, much like a negative keyword list, to help rein in some of that, that bloat in your account. Exactly. So all that dem- demographic data can be really powerful. And finally, in paid, maximized conversion value bidding is now available in all search campaigns. So this was first announced at Google Marketing Live in May, and maximized maximize conversion value aims to optimize for the greatest conversion value within your budget. And it's different than maximized conversions because we, we were just going through a pretty in-depth audit and trying to, again, cut down on some bloat. And if you've got, say, something like earplugs, like a relatively low volume, or, or sorry, a relatively low cost, let's say, and you've got something that's very large, let's say you've got something, again, let's, let's pretend we're on, I guess, a safety company here. <laughs> you've got some sort of table saw that is a safety metric and safety apparatus in there. And one is a, a $20,000 purchase and one is a 20 cent purchase. If you go towards maximized conversions and your conversion is a transaction, a 20 cent transaction is the same as a $20,000 transaction. And even though you can maximize to get as many transactions as possible, what you're not doing is maximizing to get the most money possible. And that's where something like target ROAS bidding or target return on ad spend bidding is beneficial, but this takes it to the next level to say, get me as much money as I can. Mm-hmm. Not trying to get me the best return on my dollar, but just get me the most money possible. So if you're somebody that's got a wide variation on what the product are, products are that you have in your account, or just the, the general transaction value, if it fluctuates quite a bit, this is for you. Right. So maximize conversions kind of works for a lot of performance-driven marketers where this is more for like e-commerce, like a specific portion. Yeah, or if all of your conversions are roughly the same. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's a little variation in your product, then you can maybe stick with what you've got. But if there's wide fluctuations, then this is for you. Yeah, so this is exciting. We're already testing it. And I'm going to talk about it again in a minute here. Oh, looking forward to it. It's called a spoiler. <laughs> no, not a spoiler. What is it called? The look ahead? I don't know. I don't know anything look about broadcasting. Look ahead sounds good. Tease. It's a tease. Oh, a teaser. That's what you're going for. Yes. Okay. More maximized conversion <laughs> value coming soon. In non-paid, because we're done with paid. Over to you, Greg. All right. First up this week, Facebook is developing a news tab and hiring journalists to create the top news section. This article came from Adweek. The subhead to the article was great. It's just five words. Algorithms will populate other areas, period. 
I love it when people <laughs> just give up on the subhead. But apparently, Facebook is going to be employing journalists to write the news. This seems like a terrible idea. I'm going to go out on record. This is a free one. Facebook, you can hire us for all the bad ideas. <laughs> Even before it leaks out like this did, don't hire journalists ever. What is going to happen is you're opening yourself up to being biased or having somebody mm-hmm. have a take that's not that completely vanilla. There's no benefit to hiring journalists. Sorry, don't do it. Yeah, so they said it was going to be a combination of like machine learning and the journalists picking the stories, right? Right. Well, it, it, the journalists write the top things and everything else is filled in, I guess, by did the algorithms. Hmm. Make it all algorithms. Yeah. That's what I want. You don't need anybody writing for you. No, <laughs> no. Next up is from MSPowerUser.com, a website I didn't know existed. And guess what? They're pretty pro Microsoft. Yeah. And in the article, they say that a quarter of desktop searches are now on Bing in the USA. I didn't believe this. I can't believe it still. But apparently, according to MS Power User, I think it was um, Qual. Well, metrics, one of those metrics, they all, they all kind of sound the same, those, those reporting <laughs> firms. This is Comscore that had this specific metric, but for desktop users in the U.S., 25% come from Bing. But they already used one of their best Bing jokes in this article, so they, use, they can't use it for future ones. In the very first line, did you see it? I did not see it. Like Chandler, Microsoft's Bing has long been the butt of many jokes. Do you get that? <laughs> Hope's laughing <laughs> Hope over there. Hope gets it. Is it a football joke? Like no, a it's a friend's joke. joke. Oh, fr- uh, Wilson Chandler? No, his name is Chandler Bing from Friends. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. It's um, Matthew Perry's character. Did he change his name to Chandler Microsoft Advertising That's by funny. any chance? No, okay. I don't think so. Well, anyway, we've got many clients that, that are trying to take <laughs> more spend from Google Ads and put it to Microsoft Advertising, a.k.a. Bing. Sh- you know, shout out to those clients, but... I get why, I guess. Mm-hmm. People don't know that they're binging something. That's, that's it. You type something in in the bottom of your Windows computer, and it says type to search, and all of a sudden you're, you're, in, you're binging and you have no idea. Yeah, I'll be looking for like a document, and all of a sudden I'm on yep, bing. You're, you're bing. Yeah, you, just, uh, you made up a quarter of those searches. <laughs> that's you. It's all you. Sorry. And then the other thing is if you ask anybody, they're like, I know I've never used bing. And it's like, no, I see that you came from Bing and you converted and, you know, you'll listen in or something. Like, oh, I came from Google. It's like, no, you didn't. You came from Bing. You had no idea. I think it looks pretty different. I don't know how they don't know, but more power to them. All right. Speaking of Bing, they've released a new domain connect to make sites easier to verify in webmaster tools. So what you can do now is verify a whole slew of different domains using Domain Connect. So check out the article over on Search Engine Journal. There's a nice walkthrough of how this operates, but it's less about putting the file on you know, the page and then the root domain and then going through those steps. You can just do kind of a batch approval for Bing Webmaster Tools. Next up, keeping it bulk here, <laughs> Google My Business has bulk review management. And this comes from Barry Schwartz over at Search Engine Land. And instead of going review by review by review now, you can see reviews for multiple listings at once. And Google My Business has been a little arduous in that case where you have to keep hopping in and out in and out of reviews. And here you can just see everything now and then flag things. Like, I'm going to flag this review um, in one location. So if you're somebody that gets a lot of reviews, this would be helpful. If not, I guess do better, get more people, and hopefully they're all positive reviews coming back. Next up is a tweet from John Mueller, and he tweeted the fact that it is better for him, and John Mueller is a webmaster over at, well, head of webmaster team. He's on the webmaster team over at Google, and he put out a tweet saying, it's better for me to know what the date is on content, replying to somebody. It makes it easier to recognize high-quality, evergreen content. And so the question was, hi, is it better to not have any dates of content published at all versus dates that are really ancient? And so again, John said, hey, put the date on there. And I agree, Shep. I agree. 
I, it's a pet peeve of mine to not have dates. You look at something, you have no idea, especially when you're doing how to's. I would like him to talk to Google ads about this because they don't put dates. Shots fired. Yeah. They don't put dates on their help center articles. And sometimes it's really frustrating. We saw the maximized conversion value bidding in our account this week, and we didn't know if it was new or if we missed it from last week or something. So I wanted to go back and check and see if it was released that day or if we were a little behind. And you can't find that anywhere. Right. We're yeah. We're in in this example. We're like this. We haven't seen. I didn't. This was not here yesterday. And we're like, is this made public? And it wasn't. And to your point, it was just announced. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Give me some dates. I, I want like to be dates. able to sort by the most recent updates in the help center, make sure I know what the latest thing is. Yeah, and remember from a, a search side, an organic search side, you can say when the article was first put out and then when it was modified using uh, schema data as well. So there's those the ability to also have when it started and when it was last updated. So use it. It helps <laughs> everybody. All right. Next up, LinkedIn has blocked 21.6 million accounts in the first half of the year. That's a lot of accounts, Shep. Mm -hmm. And and one thing to note, these accounts weren't like bad apples that made it through this LinkedIn filter. These accounts, 19.5 out of the 21 and change, were blocked at the registration stage, which means they didn't actually make it to the network. So that's good. Yeah, so if you're wondering... Is this person real? Were they one of these 21.5 million fake folks? Probably not. It seems like about 1 million bad apples made it through and then got kicked out. So that's at least a positive, I guess. <laughs> the other thing is I'm surprised they stop all these people from coming in and not just inflating the numbers. Oh, you are? Yeah, I actually am. I'm glad there's enough people talking on LinkedIn. I don't need fake accounts. I, I, you know what? I take your side now. I, I would even <laughs> venture to say there's too many people talking on LinkedIn. Yeah. Too many business memes <laughs> on LinkedIn. I can't do it. I don't know how people can actively use LinkedIn all the time. I get so mad when I get a notification that I have to look at it. It's just great. And then you get on there and it's it's just the sappiest business meme ever. <laughs> have you ever seen the that business? business meme. <laughs> have you ever, there's my there's only one good business meme and we'll put it in our show notes today and tweet it out from at marketing o'clock. But there's one good business meme that is, it's got some like really old school looking text and some rock music and it's just stock photo. Some guy smiling in a suit. <laughs> Only good business meme, I say. I've never seen that one. Well, check out at Marketing Clock on your social network <laughs> near you. Next up, Amazon has offered vendors Amazon choice labels in return for ad spending and lower prices. And I'm going to add in here, Allegedly. And this article came from Digiday. And apparently, there was the ability that vendors could bid for an Amazon's choice badge by either lowering prices or spending more money on advertising. That's unsavory. I don't like that. Me neither. I used to love that Amazon choice. I felt good when I'm like, oh, I picked this one too. Like me and Bezos, BFFs, you know? I use it for when I'm buying like knives and I have no idea what I'm doing. What are you doing with knives? Cooking. Oh, okay. (laughs) But I feel feel like that a lot of times Amazon Choice kind of gave me that good feeling that I did good. Mm -hmm. I picked well. I just listen to them usually. Well, not anymore, folks. (laughs) I know. Not after this news. But again, apparently it was in 2017, some of the sources that told Digiday this that the chance to bid on that mark was 2017. There was no other mention of if that still is today. I really hope it's not. I really hope the choice is a choice. And if you can bid on it, that would have to be an ad then. That would have to be disclosed, right? I would hope so. Unless there's some workaround by saying you're spending more, but then you're not buying. I don't know. I don't know how that works. Maybe this should be in paid. I might go get a law degree, (laughs) come back for next show. (laughs) But... That, that seems unsavory. I'm with you. All right, next up, something that will help you get a savory meal <laughs> in your hands quicker is a hashtag Joy Bomb from Joy Hawkins over at local <laughs> search forum. It's the Woj Bomb. She's a Joy Bomb. I know. <laughs> Adrian Wojnarowski That's went great. to St. Bonaventure University here in, in New York. Oh, you're giving it a call out? Yes. <laughs> Ignatius College is also here in Buffalo, New York. But... Anyway, so she found delivery showing up in the local listings 
at a higher frequency, where the example she had was McDonald's, and there's a whole lot of ways you can get McDonald's delivered to your house right from the local listings now. And there's some examples where you could click on through and get right to DoorDash so you can get the McDonald's delivered right on over to you. I need this for my McDonald's. I live near the worst McDonald's in America. Would you really do that? I think so. Wait, would you deli- get delivery from the worst McDonald's or would you get delivery from an outside McDonald's? Well, they're the worst because they take so long, so it wouldn't matter. Okay, but would you still order from there? Or would yes. you go? Okay, so the food is good. It's just Usually the time. Usually when you're delivering, you can't pick the location. Well, this you can because you can see multiple McDonald's. So you could choose where to get the delivery from. I would think the other ones were out of range, though. Okay. But anyway, there's nothing worse than when you're just getting a Diet Coke in the McDonald's line. Wait. <laughs> Why are you doing that? Because I just want a Diet Coke. Well, there's many stores that have Diet Cokes. Oh, my gosh. Fountain soda varies from establishment to establishment very greatly. McDonald's has the best Diet Coke. I'm pretty sure... Um, I'm going to disagree with that. You can't just make <laughs> factual statements like this no, without any data to back this up. It's so factual. <laughs> so factual. <laughs> That's how we're going with it now. Subway so is also factual. pretty good, and I don't pretty like good. Subway, but they have good diet. They have good soda. Okay. Does anybody have bad Fountain Diet Coke? Yeah, Burger King. Burger. Oh, wow. Shots well, a fired. big part of it is Burger King has those big cups. You can't get like a size small there. I don't know why. So the soda to ice ratio isn't very good, and it's never a little watered down. That's what you need. Okay. I'm gonna. <laughs> I, I'm gonna trust. I'm gonna trust you on this one. McDonald's I, has the best. I think we're going to have to take this to our after show for our next two kinds of people. So stay tuned, folks. Sounds good. All right. Next up is Pin to Interest. It's a scalable system for content classification from Pinterest. And they released their interest taxonomy. And it was really cool looking at this. Mm-hmm. They've got 10 different levels of granularity. There's 24 top level categories that all the different pins fit into. And they just released their classification system and talked about how they, again, organize all the pins and then also how ads can use it. And I think that we've talked about this quite a bit, but what Pinterest is doing from the ad perspective is really nice. And even seeing this information and then being so open about it, I love it. It's really cool. Yes. Something that is not open is Google's ability to show Full URLs anymore. I feel like we're getting to this point. We talk about it with Chrome, trying to go away from URLs. But we are seeing many URLs being dropped in the search entry results pages. And instead, seeing breadcrumbs. Well, you'll see, oh, it's marketing a clock, you know, carrot, carrot, episode 84, or whatever we're on. Instead of the link. Are we that dumb now, as a society, that we can't have a link? It's kind of easier to read, though. I hate it. I look at it and I'm like, oh my God, I I don't know what's going on. Is this going to be a PDF? Is this something I want? I hated it at first, but then I think maybe it's just because that's the way it's always been and we don't like change. I hate change. I think we could get used to it. I hate you. I just, I like the URL. Okay. Okay. Tell Google. Okay. Hey, I'm telling you. It's on record. All right. Next up, Instagram from Facebook is once again following the lead of Snapchat and it's opening up its augmented reality filter to all users. So Snapchat in late, I think fall 2018, opened up its AR platform for folks to be able to make their own filters. I think this is really cool, and Instagram is doing the same. So hopefully we see some cool new filters coming out. Shep, we were talking earlier today. I need a filter. You do? Yes. So anybody out there that's going to be developing filters, I need a filter that puts facial hair from the bottom of my mustache right to like the (laughs) bottom of my lip. That's where you can't get it? I can't grow hair there. And then to get like a dusting of of (laughs) hair on the side. Because I can't grow a beard. Okay. Just for the show? No. I just felt (laughs) self-conscious about it earlier today when we were talking. But when you're out and about, that filter isn't going to work. So. But I can still show people. Okay. You know, maybe that'll be my thing. I'll just just to see stop what you're going outside. Like. Yeah. Okay. All right. So get on that, somebody. <laughs> Next up, because I won't need this because I'm going to be inside with my filter. But anybody <laughs> that is off of Facebook performing activity will have a new option to control how websites are using. 
their data for ad targeting. This is called Off Facebook Activity. And you're going to be able to log out of any website or app that had your Facebook login. And you're also going to be able to clear that data that these third parties have. It is not going to clear what Facebook has specifically for you, so you still could get the benefit of tailored ads coming to coming your way. Um, so check that out. It has not rolled out yet fully, but there's going to be a way to clear your off Facebook activity. All right, next up, Google Search Console is showing a new image search data for AMP pages. So if you were worried that you couldn't see image search data coming from anything that you had on AMP, there's now a way. Matt Southern breaks it down over at Search Engine Journal so you can see, um, again, how to get all that information coming through. Again, keep trying to prop AMP up more and more. And lastly, from Search Engine Roundtable and Barry Schwartz, I just, I love the, uh, the title of this. Did you read this article? I did. Google, you should document if a doctor reviewed your medical <laughs> content. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> like, that's, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago, but yeah, absolutely. It's, it's something we talk about with this eat kind of you know, in your money, your life. And if you don't know, eat is the authoritativeness, trustworthiness. And I always forget the E, but it is the, help, help me out on this. You always correct me on my E's. Shep? I'm looking it up. <laughs> no? Jess always corrects me on my E's, I guess. Expertise. Eat is expertise, <laughs> authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. And that's something that, again, especially for these your money or your life sites where it's very important you get things right, that you have that credibility. So not only should you have a physician or doctor, whomever, go over what you're writing, but also say that they did it. I feel like we knew that. But surprisingly, though, people don't actually follow through. Even if you're, say, a realtor, right? You don't want to have something about how to sell your house coming from a content marketer, let's mm -hmm. say. You just be like, oh, it came from Shep and, you know, Miss Realtor Face or whatever. But if you do take the time to talk to the realtor, of course you would put it on there. People don't do that, that though. That's silly. the problem. That's the problem is it's, you look at it and people are so segmented off in their description, like their job descriptions, even at big companies, if you're in the marketing team and your job is content marketing and you go talk to somebody else in a different department, you might just quote somebody that's a doctor or quote somebody that's a realtor. And even if they vetted the whole article, you should still say, Hey, this is written by Shep and Miss Realtor Face <laughs> together. Yeah. And then anybody that's a quality rater can look at that and say, okay, it's not just somebody that I'm looking at their background and they don't look or they don't, you know, sound like their title is an actual realtor or doctor or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if you get some buy-in or you have somebody edit something, yeah. Tell us. Tell us. Okay. And that brings us to our real life segment. Straight out of our accounts and into your ear holes. It's time for Working Hard. Or Hardly Working. Where we talk about what is going on in our IRL work. Good. Bad. Or otherwise this week. Shep. What's been happening with your accounts lately? So I just have a puzzling one. Um, ever since we got the news that we can use in-market audiences with search campaigns, I wanted to try excluding more for one of our B2B clients. Amen. So excluding, I was trying to exclude arts and crafts, um, home and garden, and autos and vehicles for like an industrial product supplier that we work with. Okay. And I did so, and I tried to do it with an experiment because why not? So I have the normal campaign where we're not excluding them and I'm observing them to see how many clicks we get from those audiences. And then I have one where it's the experiment and I'm excluding them entirely. And just to back it up, so you've got this test A where you're just watching everything but yeah. still showing your ads to everybody. Mm -hmm. And then you've got test B where you are not just watching everybody, you're only showing to the people that you think are going to be the best. Right. And I want to see how that affected our conversions. And I was looking at bids because it's on ECPC bidding and it had completely different bids for the one campaign to the other. And the only change was the audiences. But how did it have different bids if you copied 
uh, I am assuming you copied. Yeah. A draft so when I copied, campaign. they were the same. But when I looked at the bid, I'm sorry, the bid estimates. Oh, bid estimates. Okay. Yeah. So the first page bid estimates, like for one, it had like a forty dollar bid for a term with the same match type. It's exactly. very LinkedIn esque. Yeah. Where you you pay substantially different amounts based on who you're targeting. So, so now I feel like this isn't really an A/B test. It's definitely not an A/B test. <laughs> it's not at all. Especially if I raise the bids, but even if I don't, like I'm not giving that other one the opportunity to do what it wants yeah. to. So I don't really know how this to This is move. a very in-depth advanced problem, but I think you raise the bids. <laughs> okay. Raise the I mean, if that's the case, because if try I, to get them as yeah. as fair as possible. Cuz if I go with that experiment of excluding them, it's going to have higher bid estimates. Right. Okay. So Thanks, raise the Greg. bids. And we'll, we'll report back and tell you in a few weeks here. All right. My hardly working now is when we're going to circle back to it. Maximize to conversion value. We saw this as soon as it came out and we're flabbergasted. We had thought we missed something and looked like, no, it just hadn't been reported yet. Um, immediately, I tried to see how this works. We went to go do an experiment. Not eligible for experiments. Weemp womp. So if you want to test maximize to conversion value, you just got to let it roll, folks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to let it roll and try to change the bids. You cannot use it as a draft in an experiment. That's a bummer. All right. And now it's time for this week's WTH. And this week's WTH comes from Buzz. Feed News, and the name of the article is, An Influencer is Defending Her Decision to Post a Photo Shoot of Her Motorcycle Accident on Instagram. That kind of sums it up, to be honest <laughs> with you. So good job, BuzzFeed. We're going to need hope on this. Yes, we will. Because she is our lifestyle <laughs> liaison here I'm at here. Marketing Clock. I have so many thoughts. I'm here. <laughs> so the Nashville-based lifestyle blogger Tiffany Mitchell Hope, did you follow Tiffany Mitchell by any chance? No, I have no idea who this girl well, she's is. She's a big name, Hope. And if you're anything, if you know anything about lifestyle or style or life, <laughs> you might know <laughs> Tiffany Mitchell. But she apparently got in a motorcycle accident and put it all on the gram from Facebook. Yeah. And in the pictures, you could see that she was on the side of the road. Her helmet was off. It seemed like she was hurt, and then all of a sudden there was a bottle of vitamin water. <laughs> or what was it, smart water? Smart water, right next to her head. And obviously there's a lot to this. You need to look at this article to see. It's very detailed. To just see how atrocious <laughs> this, this specific Instagram post was. But she, frame by frame, captured her accident and again, people were... Why? <laughs> exactly. So she says in the article, a photographer friend was driving alongside taking photos of her at the time when she got in the accident. And she just happened to get in an accident and then the friend was there to take the pictures. That's probably why she got in the accident, if she did. <laughs> why are you doing a photo shoot? She. Ju I just need to say that she has the worst friends ever because what friend takes pictures professional pictures while your friend is in a motorcycle accident? I really doubt if this is real. So one thing I noticed, if you look, that made me think this might be real is her jeans had like <laughs> rips in them, like tears, like tears across the thighs, both on and both legs. Oh, that's so uncommon. I think this is real. <laughs> I, I think this accident actually happened, but... Of course you get in an accident when you're like looking at the it photographer. Was, it was just the way... She's acting and how she proceeded after the accident. That is so cringy. This is why I hate social media. <laughs> because what happened to privacy? I just don't understand. I don't understand, one, how she thinks that she's in the right. Because she took down the post. She archived it. But she explained in another post why she's so she's so confused on why so many people are so mad. And then she put on a highlight story, which is the longest thing ever. It's a hundred stories. <laughs> it's insane. It looks like somebody just fell asleep. I didn't it's time. ridiculous. <laughs> Explaining everything, showing the entire accident from her perspective. I don't doubt that it actually happened and it was scary, but you don't 
need to publicize it on Instagram for likes and attention and it's just money. I don't understand Possibly. what happened to privacy. So Shep. I, I don't get it. You like true crime, right? Yeah. All right, click on that Twitter link in our show on our show notes here. And we're gonna run through a couple of things. Okay. As to why I think it's staged. First <laughs> off, in a joking fashion, you look at her and her first picture, her jeans are ripped. <laughs> so they're ripped before the ripped accident? Before. That is suspect. Suspect, not really. But look at the helmet. What color is the helmet? And her overalls are already falling off before. What color is the helmet? Silver. Okay. <gasps> look at the pictures next to her it's head. It's white. It's white. When you read this Tiffany's, Tiff when you read Tiffany's account of this, she says, I misjudged a curve, took it too fast, my bike went off the road, I slid through the grass. First off, all of these pictures of her are not sliding through grass. She's, yeah, she's on, on the, the, side the actual road. road. That's a problem. You didn't slide through grass and then not stage this picture. And then was this guy on a motorcycle too? Because where is it? There's two helmets. I mean, you, you had there's to get strangers. It out. <laughs> I think strangers came to help her. And That's why are strangers because, helping her? Why because her, her photographer friends? friend was taking pictures. If you're a stranger, she this is strangers the worst, to help her. The least helpful stranger. You don't. Somebody that again did, <laughs> hypothetically didn't hurt their head, and their head is like on the road, and their body's on the road. You scooch their body off the road and don't rotate their head. They're all on the road. That's how people die is staying on a road after an accident. And he's um, suspiciously well-dressed to just be a stranger. <laughs> suspiciously. I will say that everyone's yelling at this girl for posting this, but at the same time, we also yell at people for like only posting the good stuff on social media. There's a difference just between real... Devil's advocate. This I don't is, know why people think this is okay. Yeah. It's not okay. Don't post... <laughs> And don't worry about your accidents. I just. <laughs> I would never. <laughs> All right. And now it's time for this week's cool tool. As a reminder, our cool tool segment is not an official endorsement or paid mention. We're simply sharing something that we found in our travels that may be of use to our listeners. So this week's cool tool is from 538, and they are sharing the data and code behind some of their articles and graphics. So on their site, you can see a big list of a lot of their sports culture and politics content, and then next to it will be a corresponding um, piece of data. It's usually in a CSV pile that you can download, and it's the data that they collected and used to create this content. So the first example on the list that I saw was a chart with 2019 MLB predictions, and then they had the CSV file that you could use um, with all the data they collected with ELO ratings. Do you know what that is, Greg? Yeah, it's like your ability above average, right? As a, I think it's like a chess thing. But yeah. people use it for like sports too. Your big Vegas betting side is coming out. Not, not really. <laughs> I think it's a chess thing. <laughs> like, yeah. So what's really. great about this is you can use this data and do whatever you want with it and put it on your site, make your own content. So it's great that they're putting it out there for us. Yeah, and say you're a political site. You can take something like their polls. They've got a list of all the most recent polls, the Rasmussen poll, the Monmouth poll, and they can show live feeds and you can take that and design it to the way that your site should display it and take this information and then boom, you've got your own content via 538. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, 538. All right. And that brings us to our must-read marketing article of the week, an article so in-depth, so detailed that we simply cannot cover it in its entirety on today's show. And this week's article comes from Kevin Ending over at drift.com. And the article is a different take on something I just never seen this before. And he put out an article called SEO Strategies for Different Business Models. Seems pretty basic. It's B not. B versus B to C, right? It's not, though. And, and what he did is he broke it down in kind of this court quadrants, basically. He talked about people that are B to B content driven, B to B product driven, um, or inventory driven is what he called it, and then B2C inventory driven and B2C content driven. And talks about the fact that there's different strategies to take for each of these different companies. Um, Kevin did a great job of breaking down uh, some of the different ideas that these different quadrants should follow. 
um, some of the fundamentals from each of them, and then also kind of puts everything into perspective. Like just because you're in this one B2B quadrant that's inventory based doesn't mean that you don't have to be creative, that you need to know your business, you need to hire appropriately. Not everything is the same and you need to come up with your strategy and then yes, you can still be creative. So I would check it out. It is, I, I saw people sharing, I'm like, ah, I don't need to read this. I need it too mm -hmm. and you do too. So check that out. Thank you, Kevin. All right, that does it for today's show. It is now officially not marketing o'clock. Remember, you can catch everything from today's show on marketingoclock.com. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And we will see you next week.